it's all bagoking good. It's all bagoking good. I have a journal that I keep. It's not Harriet the Spy or Burn the Book level by any means, but it is my constant companion. I don't know the last time I have been anywhere without it. Lately, it hasn't had my serious venting thoughts in it. Mostly just my calories and my meal plan sketched into the ledger around silly thoughts I have throughout classes. When I write at home, I only do it in my room, with the door closed and locked, with my music cranked. It's not that I'm embarrassed of my journal, no. It's just that it has some super personal thoughts in there that I don't want anyone to see. I've kept a journal since second grade. It was a big year for me, very shaping. From the time that I read one of those early readers about a young girl traveling on the Oregon Trail, she had a paper-bound book in which she documented her life, and I thought the idea fascinating. Why wouldn't I do that? Have a journal to follow my life and my personal ventures. Of course, my life hasn't been nearly as interesting as the Oregon Trail and camping outside endlessly for months, but an eight-year-old could imagine. Over the years, I've gone through around 22 journals, keeping the pace to about two a year, with the exceptions of seventh and eighth grade. I had a lot to say those two years. Middle school was the worst. One time, I accidentally left one on the lunch table at school. It was sixth grade. I had written a love note to my crush, Hunter Garrett, and was so caught up and mesmerized by his green eyes and freckles that I collected everything off the table. Except for my journal. This awful, mean-spirited, snarky butt of a girl named Caitlin picked it off the table and then proceeded to read my love note to the class. If looks could kill... One, I'd be dead, for sure. I thought the looks Hunter Garrett gave me were going to literally spear me to the ground. He had never talked to me before, and he hadn't talked to me since. Lesson learned. Two, Caitlin would be dead. I had never seriously contemplated murder until that point. I was so angry. I forgot to be mortified for almost ten whole seconds after she had finished. Three, Ava would be dead after yesterday. Her swooping in and then almost making me a pity fat girl case in front of Michael, her life would have just ended. Right there. She'd be a pool of melted goo on the ground that I would have had to step around. I didn't speak to her the whole way home, because frankly, she deserved it. She couldn't seem to comprehend why I was so upset. And truthfully, how could she? She's never been in my shoes before. Currently, I'm in my room with the music so loud my head starts spinning with the rhythm. Not really in the mood for rock. I had selected a complicated piece from Yo-Yo Ma's classic collection. There is nothing like Bach to get your blood pumping in the afternoon. Those old ballet stretches are coming to mind. I went through the first six positions before giving up. There was no use. I couldn't concentrate. What I was trying to communicate through written word was how frustrated I felt. Never before in my life had I felt more alone than now. Desperate hunger constantly hung over me. I felt trapped eating certain foods, scared that I'd mess something up on my weight loss journey. Since I was trapped, I was hungry. Since I was hungry, I was foggy, because everything else dimmed in comparison to how my stomach felt. Ugh! And then, since I was foggy, I couldn't seem to write a solitary word onto the blank pages in front of me. Nothing felt right, or correct, or whatever. I walked around my bed a few times. My bedroom was my favorite part of our whole house. While I didn't consider myself a typical romantic or girly type female, you wouldn't be able to discern that from my decor. My walls were this beautiful rose and gold wallpaper that my mother had picked out that I had surprisingly liked. 
It was a light brocade with the faintest amount of floral design going through it. On afternoons like this, when the sun was lazily warming my room through my French windows, the whole space had a cozy feeling, like the rose hue of the wall was ready and waiting to wrap you in a hug. Our whole house had either hardwood or marble flooring, and my room was lucky enough to have hardwood, accented by this feather-like, fluffy rug under my bed. It had always made me think of a cloud, like while my bed and its four posts were enormous, on top of this white, puffy rug, it looked like airy and almost like I was flying through Belle's enchanted castle. Hmm. If I only were Belle with a magic wardrobe to give me a makeover. Wandering through my room aimlessly, I stopped at the window, wondering if today would be a good day to step out and sit in my swing chair and let the not-too-crisp air cover my body. My room was on the back of the house, so stepping out onto the window's balcony always provided the sense of absolute privacy when I needed it. If I wanted mental clarity, now would be the time to try to find it. Ava would be coming to get me soon for our evening workout. Really, I was working out, and was Ava barking directions at me? I didn't mind. She had already done her fair share of physical exercise at cheer and tumbling practice. Deciding against the balcony swing, I moved to my desk. My journal laid there, open-faced with my favorite pen, ready for me to jot down my brain jumbles. I took a seat, waiting for the right words to come. Sentences weren't forming, but certain words and images kept floating to the forefront of my mind. Fat, unhappy, scared, sad, lonely, Michael, project, mom, hungry, hungry, and carbs. Those were the prominent ideas. I couldn't talk to mom because like Ava, she didn't know how I felt. She always tried to approach me with empathy. She had explained before, but never could relate personally. What good would a list like this do? She wouldn't understand. And talking to my dad was impossible right now, since he was traveling again this month. We had got to video conference him once about a week ago, but he was in China, and his schedule was tight with all the meetings he was attending, and all his crazy obligations, and the time difference. So we all basically got to say, Hello! And we love you! Before the call was over. Uncertain, I suppose, would be my word for the day. I take my pen in hand and write it down. Self-reflection of the past couple weeks was hard, pouring my soul into the pages that were anxiously awaiting to hear my mishaps and triumphs. I told them everything I could think of. I didn't mince words when it came to where my starting weight was. When Ava had made me stand on the scale almost three weeks ago, I could have cried at the number I saw. It said 270.1. On the LED screen display, I am tall, so I wear most of it. Well, but the numbers still hurt. I couldn't live in denial anymore. And with the eating plans and workouts, life had turned up and over. Adding my good news as a silver lining, I confess that with the cut back on calories and the fervent physical exercise experiences I was having, I had already shed about 15 pounds. Honestly, you couldn't tell yet that anything was missing from the mirror's perspective, but it was a great feeling to see the number shrink, even though your goal may still seem so incredibly far away. I kept asking myself why I was going through this. Is it because I do indeed want to be happy with my health, or is it because I'm tired of fighting the constant feelings of negativity? Pondering all the possible outcomes coming down the pike for me, I scratched a couple more sentences onto the page before hearing Ava barreling through the hallway, screaming my name like a drill sergeant. My lips curl upward, because without a doubt, no one like Ava lives in this world. Leaving my room by taking my worries with me, I go out to greet her in my yogas and running shoes, ready for another training session. Life might not be perfect right now, but hopefully all this work is moving me to the brink of a new life, waiting to domino into effect after I hurl myself into the abyss. 
chicken, 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 chicken. That's all I ever freaking ate. You would think, just for fun, we would throw in some fish or like a turkey burger every once in a while. But no, all I ever ate was freaking chicken. I was making my way to the cafeteria in a huff, fuming to myself, loathing the fact that I had indeed another piece of plain breast in my plastic container. I mean, I'm literally going to turn into a huge, bagawking monster by the end of this. You might as well start calling me Foghorn Leghorn. Completely wrapped into my own thoughts, I didn't notice the mountain standing in front of me in the hallway. My face smacked into a pretty good-sized boulder, which in turn happened to be revealed as Michael's shoulder. I pulled back instantly, waiting for him to notice that the way I hit into his solid body was slightly reminiscent of the way linebackers drive holes the size of Mack trucks on football fields. His startled expression melted into humor instantly when he saw who was doing the pile drive into his mammoth back. Have I mentioned how broad his shoulders are? I mean, dang, you could build a house on them. He turned his whole body to face me, the grin staying in place the entire time he held eye contact with me. Well, well, Miss Ophelia, imagine running into you here. His words drawled, slurring them together in the most charming fashion. I tried to stop the shudder that was running electric down my spine before he noticed. He caught it, of course, but chose to ignore it like a gentleman. Thank God. Can you help it with a velvety voice like that? The tone was a deep rich, with just enough Matthew McConaughey rasp to keep you on your toes. I've actually needed to text you about an update on our schedule. Uh, I saw Ava, but she forgot to give me your number, so I figured I'd track you down and get it from you myself. Whipping out his phone, I saw him pull up the dial screen, ready to punch my numbers in. I couldn't help myself. I tenuously scanned my surroundings to see how many people were noticing that Michael Morgan was indeed getting my number. In the hallway. In front of people? No shame on his part. My breathing was slightly shallow with the weight of this incredible gift that was being handed to me. In the back of my mind, I knew this was going to put me on the Bethany radar for sure. But I didn't care. Michael Morgan was paying attention to me right now, and I wanted to soak up every great moment of it. But that's the thing about being me. I'm constantly looking over my shoulder, waiting for the moment to be sabotaged. It was then that I noticed him watching me, as if intent on reading the inner workings of my mind. I hadn't been exactly masking my facial expressions, but I know that overall, I'm a guarded person at school, so there's no telling what kind of scowl I have subconsciously donned standing in front of him as the shock of his handsomeness wears off. I was supposed to be enjoying this moment, not secretly calculating what whispers I'm going to hear about myself in the locker room later. Uh, Ophelia, are you okay? I've asked you like five times for your number. His brow was knit together. His lips had slightly pulled down at the sides. Slightly shocked that I had managed to miss his question, I gingerly took the phone out of his hands and typed in what information he needed. I looked up at him business style, sidestepping the inquiry, and simply asked, Do you need me to save it under Ophelia? Or do you think you can spell it correctly? I teased, knowing that he could indeed spell my name. He grinned, slipping the phone back into his pocket after swiping the screen. Cool. All right. Well, I'm ready to eat. Are you headed to the tables now? He starts walking, positioning himself to continue talking to me. I match his stride, answering him. Yeah, my friends Cody and Mags and I always sit together. He nodded, tipping his head towards me. Do you mind if I join you today? Uh, usually I sit with some of the guys from the team, but they're doing something right now. Is that cool? I worked on wiping the surprise from my countenance. This was a little too much. 
He didn't have to throw me a pity sit, but at the same time, I really wouldn't be mad at him choosing to sit at my table. With me. With my friends. I mean, yeah, that's totally cool. Cody and Mags were going to spit their food out. I could see Mags now, her jaw slightly slack as she observed us walking to our table together. This was going to be fun and awkward. Totally. Awkward. What are you eating today? Um, I don't even know what's in this bag. My mom has this cook that's supposed to prepare us the best, but most of what I've eaten is more than questionable. He opened the sack to prove his problem. It did look kind of weird and orange, like goop and a small sprig of garnish on the top. Contemplating the possibilities of his bag content, I verbally pondered, mm, maybe it's a type of risotto, like sweet potato of pumpkin? He shrugged noncommittally, tucking it under his arm. <laughs> you know, I may just go hit up line. I'll be back in a minute. He veered off, heading to the back of the cafe line, willing to eat mystery meat over the mystery meal his mother's cook prepared. I reached our table and sat, facing Mags, sitting beside Cody. I prepped my place quickly, their questions erupting as soon as my butt hit the seat. So, what was that? Project talk? He was talking with you and then darted off. Is he coming back? Yes, he's coming over here to sit with us. He said the guys he normally sits with are doing something, so he asked if it was cool. I said it would be fine. Is it fine? I looked between them, totally expecting them to be on board with Michael chilling with us lunch hour. Cody moved her head up and down. Absolutely, yes. I would love it if he sat here. With you. She smiled a huge smile, her eyes crinkling in the corners. Cody, no crazy stories, okay? Nothing too embarrassing. Let's act cool, I begged. Oh, Opie, you're too uptight. We'll be on mostly good behavior, Mags quicked, sipping her water with a mischievous glint in her eye. I groaned. He was walking towards us with his tray. Y'all be nice. That's all I got out before he slipped in the seat next to Mags. Hey, guys. Uh, I don't think we've officially met. Uh, I'm Michael. He took his time introducing himself to Mags and Cody. They obviously knew who he was, but there's nothing more attractive than a man with nice manners. They reciprocated, letting niceties start casual chatter between our group. Michael reached for his phone in his pocket, moving his thumb across the screen. I watched his movements carefully, trying to not be too obvious. I heard the ping notification bell on my phone. I inspected my screen my eyes rounding when I see who the message is from. Oof! I needed to save his number in my phone, I guess. Unknown. I like your friends. They are nice. The ping sounded off again. Unknown. Not as cool as you, but that's okay. My face lit on fire. Was Michael Morgan flirting with me? way to a great day. I felt like I had been reading about Rachel and Andrew Jackson for hours. I knew almost everything about them now. Honest, I think I do. They never had children, but adopted one of her nephews and named him Andrew Jackson Jr., they were illegally married until she realized that her divorce had never been finalized. The hermitage was self-sustaining. I could give you names, dates, birthdays, and more. The information was all starting to blur together. Staring at my computer screen, I took a sip of my lemon water. Gulping it down, I typed a couple of sentences. Rachel and Andrew Jackson shared a love that people of their time couldn't comprehend. In a world where marriages were treated as business transactions, Andrew broke the husband mold, giving himself over to his wife without hesitation. Their love was one of deep devotion and constant communication. Andrew was rumored to even carry a small portrait of Rachel in his breast pocket when traveling abroad, hoping to always remember her sweet face. 
Rachel was never considered a beauty by the current social standards. She was referred to by her peers as a piously religious, country-looking woman who kept to herself. Rachel admitted in a letter once that she did not enjoy parties and social functions, but would rather spend all her time either with her family or in the house of God. Pausing, I looked through the book I had opened on my desk, skimming the page for the information I needed. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be loved so intimately? Andrew and Rachel were adorable. I had picked them because of this alone. Andrew had accomplished so much, and he accredited so much of it to her, and how supportive she was of his endeavors. I had been to the Hermitage when I was little, and their story had come alive for me. I hadn't had a chance to ask Michael why he was so drawn to them. There was a lot to say about Jackson himself, being a president and entrepreneur. Scanning my notes, I noticed that most of the sentences I had strung together focused solely on their love relationship. This wasn't good. I needed to break it up and add some political milestones into the mix. Finally! I was expecting a text from Mags. This week our fundraisers at school had started, and we had been running like maniacs to get everything done. I had been placed in charge of the snack stand at the football games. We did our version of the snack stand slash food truck when the weather turned. People were incredibly willing to spend money when there was cocoa and apple cider available in cool temperatures. It was always our biggest moneymaker, and it had become the biggest responsibility. I had to make sure the supply orders had come in correctly, using notes that we had left over from last year, and I had to make sure that the truck was ready to go. We still had to follow certain health codes to keep restaurant guidelines with the food truck and had to have it inspected before our first use. I felt very adult setting up appointments. Our council sponsor this year was our English lit teacher, Ms. McGregor. And boy, was she something. She was one of the coolest adults I've ever met in my life. She was only 30 and hilarious on our level. Every assignment she gave was interesting, and every interaction I had with her made me feel special, like she truly saw me and believed in me. We had talked about writing a couple of times and what our journals meant to us. And for real, she is just good people. So... Her putting me in charge of this was a huge compliment, since she believed I could do it and succeed. Mags had been put in charge of the silent auction to take place at our October Harvest Fest. We were supposed to be collaborating, which meant I was helping her get ideas of whom to ask for donations. Usually, it was a no-brainer. Local businesses always wanted to be involved for the free advertising they received in exchange at the event. Our school had been throwing the biggest harvest fest for years, attracting people from miles around. Harvest fest is comparable to any state fair you have ever been to. We have a carnival and games and booths with crafts and food trucks and a battle of the bands competition that offered $500 in studio time for local artists to make an EP. The silent auction generated about 30% of our revenue that went directly to the school fund that supported scholarships and extracurricular programs. Last year, that's how the computer lab was able to add six new touchscreens that were super advanced, and a couple of smart boards for the teachers in the science department. I was supposed to ask Dad about donating something rare from one of his many trips abroad. He had a way of collecting weird and special pieces from the different continents that he had visited. Last time, he came from Asia, visiting Japan. He had returned with a traditional-style hakama that has since been framed and placed in his office. It hangs on the wall in his study between a suit of armor and a skull that has been rumored to be the skull that was used in Shakespeare's Hamlet, performed by the Royal Shakespeare Company. My dad talks to it, calling it Yorick, just like Hamlet, when he was an issue. My dad uses comedy to assuage his grief often. It's never boring when he's home. Her text was pretty much along those lines. Mags, have you asked your dad about donating yet? I sighed. No, he still wasn't home. Me, no, 
He's supposed to be home later this week. Don't worry. If he isn't home, I'll have my mom put something in the auction. Mags. Okay, just don't forget. I need to know as soon as possible. Jeez, I know Mags is an overachiever, but come on now. Nagging is so beneath her. I place my phone on the desktop, moving to shift through my sticky notes to my paper outline. I swear, if that's her with another freaking reminder about the auction, I'm going to ride my bike to her house and throttle her. Picking up my phone, the screen brightens. The preview lights up the text, and I feel my breath catch in my throat. It's from Michael. Hey, what's up? My pulse quickened. How do you sound cool? I sat, frozen, contemplating what to say. I remembered that yoga breathing technique that Ava had showed me. Slinking to the floor, I sat cross-legged, thankful that I had opted for leggings as my choice of loungewear this evening. In the nose out the mouth. I held the phone to my face, making sure his name was indeed on the screen, and I hadn't read it incorrectly. What was I saying? I knew it was him. Oh my gosh, I could not look dumb right now. I typed my first reply in. Me? Just chilling in my room. How about you? Oh no, no, that was so stupid. I deleted it out. Okay, focus. Working on my project outline by beefing up my research notes. How's your evening? Heck no, nerd alert. I backspaced until that shameful attempt disappeared. Me, NM, you? Perfect. Just the right amount of distraction, vagueness, and simplicity. He'll think I'm so normal. Michael. Working on our project, smiley face. I was wondering if you were free tomorrow to go over some stuff. Me. Hold on, let me check something. Selecting the right date in my planner, I ran a finger down my column of to-dos. I knew there was a ton of stuff on the schedule with the fundraisers, but if he had an opening between practices, I needed to try to make it work for both of us. Crap! I did have the food delivery tomorrow, but it shouldn't keep me longer than 5 p.m., could you do it around 5.30 or 6? Or do we need to do it directly after school? I waited. Nothing. Fifteen minutes passed. Nothing. Well, do I double text him? Or do I wait? Goodness. Honey, I'm home. My ears perked and I sat up straight from my place on the floor. Was that my dad? Home at last? That was his voice over the intercom. No one else ever used it except for him. It was one of those house accessories that everyone thought they needed, but hardly anyone ever touched. It had to be him. He was home earlier than I thought. I jumped up, running through my room. I swung the heavy wooden door open and made my way toward the staircase. Listening intently, I can't hear if my mom is there or not. It's too quiet down below. I walked past the first balcony to see if I could get a better view of the foyer. I couldn't see anything past the chandelier. I know that I can only see the chandelier from there. I've lived here my whole life, but I can't help the excitement bubbling out from within me. Quickening my pace, I passed the second balcony, still not able to see any movement down below. Since my room was on the back of the east wing of our home, I had the longest walk to the entrance from almost any other point in the house. I didn't mind it, unless there were times like these where it seemed the hallways would never end. The spiral of the wooden handrail coming into view, I made my way gingerly down the imperial staircase. I can't figure out why I can't see anything. There wasn't a soul at the foot of the steps. I caught the sight of the back of a maid's uniform. The housekeepers were here today, preparing for my father's arrival. Mom was pretty lax with her own housework, so she hired a local service to come three times a week to tidy. We weren't messy people, but honestly, the house was too big for one person to clean. I followed the uniform into the formal sitting room to my right, feeling the cold marble under my toes as I padded softly behind her.
This person had brown hair with a slight gray streak running through it. It had to be Anna. She was the coolest chick out of the people that came to clean. I cleared my throat to let her know I was behind her. <clears throat> Anna whirled around to face me, a bewildered expression plastered on her face. The laugh lines around her mouth disappeared for a split second before she relaxed her demeanor and let her wrinkles lay into place. Anna had been a smoker for years, and her pucker rested just long enough for her to pretend to be mad. But her faux finger only lasted a moment before she was wrapping me into a hug. Girl, I don't know who was behind me. You were using your sneaky feet, apparently. She leaned back, squeezing my arms while she looked at me. I haven't seen you in about a month. Tell me how you are, friend. I heard your daddy is coming back to town. I sincerely have always loved the way that Anna has smelled. It was like menthol cigarettes and peppermint candies with the touch of floral hand soap all muddled together. She's like the grandmother I always wished to have, and I couldn't imagine anyone else doing the role justice like she did. The opportunity to meet my grandparents was never an option for me. They had all passed away before I was born, so she was the closest thing to a grandmother that I could imagine to having. She knew everything about me, even the weird stuff that I hadn't told Cody or Mags, which was odd since I got to spend so little time with her. My mother didn't necessarily disapprove of our relationship. She didn't encourage it either. But we have never let that stop us from bonding and loving each other until it's time for her to leave for the night. She didn't know about Michael yet, and I was dying to tell her. But first, I needed to know about Dad. I know! I've missed you so much! Have you seen my dad, actually? I thought I heard him talking over the intercom, but I haven't seen any signs of him down here. Anna moved a vase to dust beneath it before answering. I'm pretty sure I saw him slip towards the study. Your mama had a tray in her hands following him. I'd look there first. She smiled warmly as I leaned down to peck her cheek. Thanks, Anna. I'll be back in a minute. Anna was right. My dad and mom were in his study, wrapped in a steamy embrace. I about threw up watching them. I knocked on the open door. More a warning for them versus an invitation for me. They drew back slowly, my dad's hands on my mother's waist. Yes? He answered. Dad, you're home early. I ran on my tiptoes to him, excited for a hug of my own. Except, you know, less creepy. Realization at who had interrupted them dawned on his eyes, and for the first time in a month, he got to look at me. Once I got to him, he squeezed me tight, and I was choking him with ferocity from my arms thrown around his neck. There's my girl, he managed to squeak out. Satisfied, I dropped my arms and took a step back. We have so much to tell you. I filled Dad in on everything over dinner. We all did, taking turns to word vomit all our news. Overwhelmed as per usual, he took a sip of scotch that Mom had poured him letting it settle before addressing us. Well, you ladies never disappoint me. I don't think I've been half as busy as you three, especially you, Opie. He laid his hand over mine, stroking the back of my hand with his thumb. That wasn't a good sign. Every time he looked like this, there was a mental storm brewing. He turned to Mom and Ava, and on mine. Did you all decide it was time for Opie? To start this sort of business? Losing weight? Really, Angela? I drew back, shocked by his words. By the look on my mother's face, so was she. He never used her given name. He almost always called her Babe. Dad wasn't normally given over to anger buildup, so I wasn't so sure why this was affecting him the way it was. I thought he would be as proud of me as the rest of the world was. Drawing a long breath, he withdrew his hand from the top of mine, dropping his head into both of his hands, his fingers massaging circles into his temples. Opie, why don't you join me in my study? I think we need to chat. And with that, his chair inched back and he was gone. 
Solemnly looking between Mom and Ava, I followed suit and made my way to his study. Ava wouldn't even make eye contact with me as I brushed past them from the dining room into the hall. Pushing the door open, I stepped inside my dad's study for the second time that day. Funny how earlier walking through these doors had been fun, but now I felt like I was at the principal's office for committing a vile act. I sat in one of the leather wingback chairs that were placed in front of his rather large desk. My father was notoriously messy. They say it's a true sign of a genius, and it truly might be. There were stacks upon stacks of paper everywhere you looked. Clearing my throat, I waited for him to turn and acknowledge me. He was standing behind his desk, his back to me, looking through the floor to ceiling windows that faced the back of the property. He had his pipe in his hand, a true signal of trouble. The smell of tobacco wasn't very strong, but it was definitely present. Circling to face me, he placed his hand to brace himself against the hard leather of his desk chair. This chair was mammoth, black, and had bronze rivets that studded the enormous shape perfectly. He looked like one of the portraits hanging on the wall in there, imperious and in control, whether he felt it or not. Inhaling a long breath on his pipe, he took the time to really examine me. His eyes were trying to crack my code. Was I really invested in trying to lose weight? Was it Mom and Ava's idea? And I was coerced into participating. I took advantage of the silence. Dad, you don't need to be mad at Mom. This was completely my idea. I'm the one who took the initiative. I'm the one who asked for help. I'm the one who was stuck with it, and I'm really proud of what I've accomplished so far. I'm down almost 20 pounds. I leaned back into the chair, waiting for him to respond. He took another moment to consider before opening his mouth. Opie, I'm not sure why you feel the need to lose weight. I thought you were happy as you were. I'm concerned that this process will take an unhealthy toll on you. I don't want you to get your hopes up prematurely. Does that make sense? I stared at him, dumbfounded. What did he mean, get my hopes up? Dad, do you not think that I can do this? I asked with a bite in my voice that I hadn't expected. A raw, emotional reaction creeping up to ruin the high I've been on for weeks now. Why couldn't my dad believe in me like everyone else? Is that what this was? It's not at all that I don't think you can do it. I know you can do whatever you want to. What scares me is that at the end of this, the result is that you're going to be disappointed. I don't want you to get hurt. I heard him, but my mind hadn't listened to the last sentence. How did he know what I was going to feel? How was this fair to me? Why was he even this concerned if he wasn't even home 80% of the time? It would be a lie to say that I wasn't pissed, because I was. I felt so undercut. I let my eyes roam the room, carefully weighing my next words. All the portraits of Hamilton's before us, staring down from their high places on the wall, the books with boundless amounts of information and records of progress. Ha! Let's not use the word progress in this room. Before I had enough time to process, Dad started. By the way, I have a trip planned for us coming up in a couple of weeks. Curious, I let him continue. It's in Alabama. We'll be gone for about four days. You can be my caddy girl. I suppressed the urge to roll my eyes. This was his answer to me changing my routine, doing something so within the walls of ordinary that I would scream. We've been doing trips like this forever. I was like the son that my father never had. Ava got to be a girl, and I was the one following in Dad's footsteps. Had I minded before? I don't know. No, it was our special one-on-one -on -one time. He took me on almost all of his golf trips, using excuses with my mom like, She'll learn the art of war. It'll help her in the future. Or, 
Ophelia is my girl. This is our thing. Don't try to ruin it. I think he had had to revert to that line of reasoning when my mom had tried to insist that I stay home for a cotillion about a year ago. But Dad wouldn't have it. He was prepping me for his business. He was letting me into his world. And, truthfully, I had one heck of a golf swing. Usually, this kind of trip is something that I'd look forward to. But seriously? I couldn't help but wonder if this trip was a whim based off of dinner conversation, or if it truly had been in the works for a while. I'll probably never know. But I had a feeling. The timing was awful, since this was the busiest time of the year for me, with about a million things going on, and Michael was my partner, and assignments were coming up. But the Hamilton and me put my chin up. Nothing was ever going to change. Yeah, Dad, sounds awesome. School is hard, but it's always ten times worse when you're distracted. It feels like the hands on the clock are stuck, and you're in a time vortex that has no end. At least, that's how I see it. The first four periods of the day were crawling at a snail's pace. The only thing that had been good about any of my classes was that I got to see the back of Michael's head in two of those classes. I had kept my eyes averted when he walked in, since I was a little uncertain after him not replying last night. Reason would say that he was busy, but the devil on my shoulder was telling me that he was annoyed that I was his partner. I know, it's ridiculous. But between my dad and everything else, I feel like my world is just wobbly right now, and nothing really makes sense. So when the bell finally rang, and it was time for lunch break, I seriously about broke into the Hallelujah Chorus. I hurried to my locker to grab my tote. I had forgotten to grab it, so I could go directly to lunch after class. Slamming the door back into place, I whipped around and into the very solid chest of Michael Morgan. I took a step back, letting my hand cover my mouth as a little gasp escaped. Michael laughed. I feel like I'm always scaring you. You jump out of your skin every time I even get close. It's hilarious. He rubbed his chest where my head had smacked him. Anyways, I was coming over here to apologize for not texting you back last night. I got caught up with my dad coming home and totally forgot what we were planning. I visibly melted with relief when he said that. All of that stress had released. He wasn't annoyed. Just happy to see his dad like I was. I was beaming at him. Oh, it's not a problem. I think my dad must have gotten home around the same time as yours. I had completely forgotten to check my phone after that. Lies. I had checked my phone, like three more times that night, to make sure I hadn't missed anything from him. He bought my lie, however. Phew, I'm glad. I didn't want you to be upset with me. He ran his hand through his hair, smoothing his long locks back behind his ear. Had I heard him correctly? He didn't want me to be mad at him? What universe was this? No, not mad at all. I guess we do need to come up with a plan, though. After five still works for me today. I was internally exploding with happiness. I hope to God that he was still available today. He smiled down at me. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Are you going to be here at five? Had I mentioned the truck to him? I couldn't remember. Yep, I've got to check in the supply order for the game this weekend. The food trucks are my territory this season. Right on. Well, I have practice tonight, but I could pick you up at five and then drop you back at your house when I have to leave. Would that work? He was biting his lip. How freaking adorable. I'm pretty sure I'd move heaven and earth to make anything work for this guy. Sure. My heart leapt inside my chest. Great. I'll pick you up where? Uh, the outside of the field beside the ball entrance? Cool. He was walking backwards towards the lunchroom. I followed his cues to walk that way too. 
feeling lighter than air. Cool, I responded. This was shaping up to be a great day.